You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. to be an addict now he's substance free telling all about his crazy journey take off that mask and take on your addiction alan charles author and keynote speaker on drug abuse and prevention and the host of the alan charles show is here to bring hope to the hopeless as he shares his unbelievable luck at surviving a 24-year drug addiction Alan's raw honesty and courageous heart breaks the stigma of addiction and offers a unique perspective into the mind of an addict. So now, please welcome the host of The Alan Charles Show, Alan Charles. He's given us the real story, The Alan Charles Show. Ups and downs, losing jobs and the glory, The Alan Charles Show. He helps others avoid that purgatory. The Alan Charles Show. Good evening and welcome, everybody. This is indeed the Alan Charles Show coming to you live from New York City on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And I am your host, Alan Charles, and uh, I am so glad that you're here this evening. Uh, Tonight, we're going to be talking about interventions and do interventions work and there are a few different kind of interventions um i believe the most mainstream common thought when you hear an intervention it's a drug intervention and we've seen them on televisions or i believe there was a show or is a show intervention uh and it's It's not quite what it looks like on TV or in the movies, but we're going to talk about it and we're going to see if it actually works. We're going to tell you all about how to do it and the things to kind of set it up. And somewhere in there, I am going to share my own intervention story and what it was like while I was going through addiction. And I had a surprise. Well, most of them are surprises, but I I had a surprise intervention. And uh, we're going to share all the details with that a little bit later. Uh, First, let me tell you a little bit about how I got here. For those of you that are new to the show, Um, pretty middle class, um, average life growing up early on. Um, but uh, at nine years old, I lost my father. Household became dysfunctional. Growing up, uh, it was like a war zone. And uh, I was basically on my own and uh, went to college, uh, dreams of playing professional baseball. But I didn't have a solid foundation and I was filled with anxiety and fear. And One day I tried cocaine and it was at 24 years old. And I believe that I was addicted from that very first line. It took the knot and the anxiety and the fears and everything right away. Instantaneously, I became a totally different person after doing that first line. I I never felt like that before. And, you know, just even sitting here, just sharing this brief, brief thing. I still feel that first night that I did that first line of cocaine. So, yeah, it was I was addicted and uh, it lasted for a long time. And uh, I lost everything during my 24 year addiction uh, through two marriages. I uh, had children with my second wife and uh, ended up not being able to see or talk to them for a while. Uh, lost jobs, money, houses, apartments, pets, every physical possession I lost because of 
the addiction uh, and the disease. Um, but miraculously, after years and years of trying to find recovery, um, I finally made it in, put a year together. One year turned to two. My life started to change. I got my life back. Things started getting better. And then from there, I wrote a book about my journey, which is called Walking Out the Other Side, an addict's journey from loneliness to life. And if you Google Walking Out the Other Side, you will be able to see all the different things I have on the internet and different social media platforms, as well as the book. And that's how Bold Brave Media found me. And here I am with a radio show. So we're so over 13 plus years 13 plus, what am I saying? 12, I'm coming up on 13, 13 in December. Um, but you're in the right place. This is the stigma free zone. And we're here because addiction is a disease. And uh, people that face the challenges of addiction um, with everything that has been said about addicts and just say no, and you're a weak person, and all the things that go on with that, those are so untrue. So we're here to take that part away because that's still keeping a lot of people out there. Okay, so tonight, let's see, I'm here live in New York City. We've got a 64-degree evening. It's very comfortable uh, the Yankees just won their first two playoff games in the wild card series, and they're moving on. Uh, let's see, I've got uh, the Cardinals Padres game on, and this is the second game of their series. Uh, the Cardinals won yesterday, so if the Padres don't win today, they're eliminated. So, yeah, it's pretty amazing that we're getting back to life, and there's baseball going on, and it's the postseason, and Oh, but it, it doesn't feel back to normal. I'm, I'm still feeling tons of anxiety, uh, still concerned, worried about what's it going to be like in the fall and the winter. Uh, are we getting that second wave? What's going to happen? And I know that's that's challenging and you don't want to live in that place. But you know what? I put it out there because I, I call it like it is. And that's something that I am working on Um maybe listening a little too much to the news, um, reading all online articles, watching the debate and getting sick to my stomach. Um, yeah, it's uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. So we'll, we'll try to cut down. And I know we all face our different challenges. OK, Engineer Shaw, let's go to the news. Okay, let's start out with ah, Atlantic City, New Jersey. Police say a man was arrested with heroin after being caught making a drug deal while his two-year-old daughter was in his car. So the incident happened, like I said, in Atlantic City. And according to police, detectives observed 36-year-old Robert Hart of Pleasantville, New Jersey, driving a vehicle. However, one of the detectives knew that Hart was driving with a suspended license. How? I don't know, but let's assume he did from the article. When the detectives turned their vehicle around to conduct a motor vehicle stop, they saw Hart pull to the curb and conduct a drug transaction. When Hart pulled away, the detectives attempted to stop him, but he continued for several more blocks before finally being stopped. Police say Hart was arrested after finding 500 bags of heroin while his two-year-old daughter was inside the car. After Hart was taken into custody, police say he resisted getting into the patrol car and kicked an officer and a detective. The officer was treated on the scene for an injury. The young girl was turned over to her mother. Hart is facing multiple charges, including possession of a controlled, dangerous substance, child endangerment, and resisting arrest. He was remanded to the Atlantic County Justice Facility. My second news story deals with Dax Shepard. But you know what? We're going to take a quick break. When we get back, you'll find out about Dax. You're listening to the Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We'll be right back. 
If you seek a courageous advocate, prepare to champion your rights with consumer service agencies that support aging populations, Carol Ann Hamilton is the one for you. Carol Ann is an elder care coach, author, and speaker with a quarter million hours lived experience successfully supporting unculpable aging parents. As a result of a challenging journey, Carol Ann revolutionizes how stressed out caregivers restore serenity to their worlds. She also brings over 25 years of change management expertise in Fortune 500 settings to catalyze urgent transformation within the elder care industry. Carol Ann is a popular speaker at conferences across North America. She has appeared via TV, radio, and print globally. Now you can tune in weekly to get a dose of her inspiration, plus down-to-earth advice to cope with even the most difficult aging parents. Listen Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Eastern on Bold Brave Media and TuneIn Radio. Have you ever felt like no one is listening or you're not getting the honest attention you deserve? Do you even know the kind of attention you want or need? You are not alone. Alice Aspen March is here to help. Thanks to Alice, through her epiphany and research over the word attention, there are solutions to the attention dilemma. Worldwide audiences have been enthralled and engaged for over 40 years with her visionary and pioneering observations. The kind of attention we get and give is vital to improving our lives and society. Alice and her weekly guests review game-changing insights for transforming and improving our understanding of attention, providing techniques for creating healthier and empowering behavior. Get a new perspective on a mainstream word. Tune into Why Our Attention Matters for fresh and thought-provoking conversations every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern on BoldBraveMedia.com and the TuneIn Radio app. Welcome back to the Alan Charles Show Live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And I'm your host, Alan Charles. And before we went to break, we had just started the news and I had shared a story about a gentleman who uh, had his two-year-old in the car and was caught with 500 bags of heroin. Probably not a good thing to do. But you know what? I've done stuff like that, and I am not proud of it. Um, and, I, and I believe I've shared this on the show before. I know it is in my book um, where I had my daughter Sammy in um, her uh, chair, her, her baby seat, and uh, headed home. But I decided to make a pit stop and go up to Washington Heights, and we got stuck in traffic and uh, I but I still went. I still got the cocaine um, and I did it while I was driving in the car. And, you know, I look back at it now and I'm like, oh, my God, that, that's horrible. And then here I am giving you the news story. But you know what? I did the same thing. I just didn't get caught. And that's what a lot of addicts and um, alcoholics do. OK, so let's get back to the news. Dak Shepard, he's opening up about his sobriety. And uh, in the September 25th episode of his podcast, Armchair Expert, uh, the 45 year old actor, he's been sober for six years, 16 years. He revealed that he recently relapsed and he's been taking opioids. So he had detailed several of his bumps in the roads he experienced over the last eight years. He also spoke about how his life changed following his latest round of injuries, which started six months ago. So he spoke about the last eight weeks um, taking Vicodin for pain. And so he figured I'm allowed to be on them. And at some point, because he had his prescription. So um, because Shepard, who's wed to Kristen Bell, actor or actress, was still able to fulfill his day to day responsibilities, he didn't think there was an issue. But after his podcast co host, Monica Padman, confronted him, he started lying to her. And I hate it, he said. And I'm lying to other people and I know I have to quit, but my tolerance is going up so quickly that I'm now in a situation where I'm taking, you know, maybe 30, um, 30, 830 grams a day. 
or milligrams. And I know that's an amount that's going to result in a pretty bad withdrawal. I'm starting to get really scared and I'm starting to feel really lonely. And I just have this enormous secret. And then less than two weeks ago, he was sitting in a car with Padman and he decided to tell the truth, not only to her, but to his wife as well. And then he started attending AA meetings and began experiencing withdrawal symptoms. I'm sweating like bullocks. I'm jerky. My back kills. It's terrible, he recalled. I never detoxified from opiates, and I have so much compassion for these junkies who have, like, effing cycling through this 20 or 30 times. And uh, he shared on his podcast that he was only 11 days sober now. Uh, And the story goes on and on. But I want to wish him good luck. And again, I can tell you, I know exactly what he is talking about. Um, I was on opioids. And um, I mean, I used opioids during my addiction um, recreationally and things like that. But fortunately, it never got to an addiction point. But. Uh, I have had five knee operations where I needed to have opioids and um, it included a bunch of knee replacements. So I was on them for about four to five weeks, taking them as prescribed, telling my sponsor what I was doing and he was managing. He wasn't at my apartment. I had them. I could have taken more, but I was open and I told him exactly what I was doing all the time with the medication. But after about four to five weeks, as I'm sharing, he would say, Alan, It's time to get off the pain meds. You're an addict. Now, we don't preach, you know, you don't, we're not martyrs. There's no reason that I have to be in pain or if I take ibuprofen, uh, that doesn't work. Well, we can't give you the narcotics. Well, you know, these were major operations. And even with the medication, I was still in pain. That's how bad the operations and recovery were. But at the end of the day, talking about, getting off the medications and withdrawing. Oh my God, uh, because I knew it was going to happen every time. And four weeks, five weeks on opioids, you are going to have a major withdrawal. And for three days, I couldn't sleep. I was sweating. All the things that I just read from Dak Shepard, um, just crazy thoughts. My head was just banging inside, headaches and sweating and Oh, feeling uncomfortable and irritable. Oh, it's just not something that's that's fun to go through. So hats off to Dax Shepard for moving forward and, uh, you know, sharing what was going on. And, uh, you know, thank God uh, you're sober again. Okay, let's get right into tonight's show. So some people need help. Some people refuse to go for help. Um, Some people are using it and they're not even aware that they have a problem. So if somebody wants to help a loved one, a friend, there are a lot of different ways to help them. But the one that we're going to talk about tonight is putting together an intervention. And so let's talk a little bit about interventions. So those who have witnessed a loved one struggle with substances and agree that the addiction is a powerful condition that provokes continuous cycles of confrontation, devastation, and sadness. So what that basically means is here you are with your loved one and you're forced to watch them struggle. And here they are. They can't control it. You can't control it. Maybe you thought you could or they're telling you they can control it, but you're seeing that this thing is spiraling out of control. There's a feeling of hopelessness. And as you continue to watch this loved one struggle, desperation will start to set in. So whether you've circled um, around your loved one and tried to get them to to stop You've talked to them. Uh, You've tried to discuss how bad things are. You can tell them you're concerned. You've had other people lovingly speak to them at some point. And this is from experience. Unless they want to get better, which is like hitting a bottom for the person because every bottom is different. There, most people 
are not going to say it's okay to have an intervention because there are interventions where they say we're doing an intervention you're going to sit here and and we'll arrange it but you know what we're going to take a quick break you're going to hear all about interventions when we get back you're listening to the alan charles show live on the bbm global network and tune on radio we'll be right back what if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick. Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy EasySense.com and learn how, with your help, we can fight these horrific brain disorders. That's EasySense.com to learn more and help support the Broderick Foundation. Tune into It's All About You with host Dr. Martha Latz, a lively weekly broadcast on BBM Global Network, one of the most empowering shows for time-starved, overscheduled multitaskers. The professional expertise of Dr. Latz is directly available live every Thursday at 1 p.m. to answer and address concerns about relationships, life transitions of career, meeting, dating, and committed relationships. It's All About You with Dr. Latz will expand your understanding of career current concerns across your relationships by broadening and expanding possible solutions in developing skills for mutually desired outcomes. Dr. Martha's expertise is as a licensed marriage and family therapist, life, transition coach, and all things to do with communication at work, home, and with friends. Check out her website at auniquetherapycenter.com. Welcome back to the Alan Charles Show, live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And I am your host, Alan Charles, and I am glad that you are here. Before we went to break, we started to talk about interventions. And, um, you know, let, let me just break it down. An intervention is a well-organized process designed to break through an addict's an addicted person's denial so that they can recognize and change their self-destructive behaviors. Unlike the hostile or haphazard interventions sometimes depicted in movies and television shows, intervention should be well planned to ensure the environment is calm and controlled. So when you start an intervention, um, the process hinges on the preparation um, and so let me let me give you a little idea of what it looks like. And I'll actually at this point, why don't we I'll start to tell you the story of my intervention. So let me set this up for you here. Uh, I am married to Stacy. Uh, we are living in the city. I am working at an out of home advertising company. I I can say it. I wrote it in the book. It's out there. So I was working for Clear Channel Outdoor and I had a really good job and I was doing really well. And I was also continuing to get my addiction. Cocaine was getting worse. And so I guess What I found out later was is that I was getting worse and worse and worse and people were seeing that. And so my wife at the time, Stacy, decided to do an intervention. So one of the things which I was going to share with you a little later, but I can jump to now is if you're putting an intervention together, you know, one of the main things to do is to get a professional, somebody that specializes in interventions um, or, or work, and that way they can work directly with the therapist, um, your therapist, uh, the person that's going through the intervention, to, so that way they have a better handle on what the reaction might 
be, they, you know, they know the person, they know their ways and, you know, their hot spots and, you know, how best maybe to get through so that you can help the addict because it's very hard. And again, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you this again, um, from everything that I know and have seen, and I know from, from myself, unless you're ready to quit and you want help, the intervention is not going to help. Nothing is going to help. It, it, the consequences aren't going to make you change your mind. You might do something just to kind of pander and get through it. But as soon as you do whatever people are asking you to do, you're going to go right back and do what you want. You have to have that intention that built up inside that you really want to get better. So Stacy ended up going to my therapist who she knew who every time or when I would disappear and after a couple of days she would let my therapist know that I was missing again and uh you know said I guess they had a a decent relationship or professional relationship or or both interest in helping me and so Stacy had arranged the intervention through my therapist which I had no idea they were in contact or or what was going on. So the way it set up was I we lived in the city. My mother-in-law and father-in-law had an apartment in the city. And then also I worked not too far away um, down on 42nd Street uh, and Lex right in Midtown there. And um I was in my office and I don't know, it was about, oh, I'd say it was close to lunchtime, maybe like 1130 if I, if I had a guess. And it was my wife and she called and said, listen, I'm at my mom's apartment. She doesn't feel well. I think we need your help. Can you, do you have time to just run up here? And I said, well, what do you need me to do? And she just, can you please come, come, we need help. I got to get back to her. So I said, okay. So I I had a lot of flexibility. Uh, I've been in sales and, you know, you can always, that's one of the things that I really love about sales uh, or at least most sales jobs is that you can come and go as you need to. And uh, if there's something you need to slide in personal to do, as long as you're doing your work and you're being successful, you can go do the things you need to do. So here I am, I'm running back uh, uptown to where did she live? All of a sudden, I'm drawing a boy. 66th Street and um, and 2nd. So I'm going back up. I take the subway, uh, go up into the building, and go and ring the bell at the door. And to my shock, after I ring the bell, the door opens. And it's my therapist, Nancy, answering the door. And I... Uh, to say I was in shock is would be mild. I'm I looked at her and I computed it really quickly and I'm like, oh crap! And I probably used a different word. And um, and she said, come in. And and I did not. I could feel myself pulling away from the door. Uh, that was not the direction that I had intended or wanted to go at that point. So I had come in, and as you you walk in, and just as you step in about three steps to the left, you make the left, follow the floor, and that opens up into the living room. So as soon as I make the left, I see this line of chairs. And I don't off the top of my head, I don't know, maybe seven, eight, but I'm going to share with you all the people that had chairs. But there was seven or eight chairs facing one way and one chair facing towards the other seven chairs. So I kind of knew which chair was for me. This this definitely did not look promising. And all I could think about now I started to think about how do I get out of this? How do I get out of this? Um, people were there and I felt necessary to say hello. I hugged people. So when I came in, my wife was there. Her mother and father. So my mother-in-law and my father-in-law. Now I was in a pretty 
crazy place um, just in my head. Um, I had different sponsors. You know what? Stick around. Let's hear what our buddy Dwight Gooden has to say, and we'll share all that when we get back from this break. Hello, this is Doc Gooden of the New York Mets, 1986 World Series champion. You are listening to the Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and tune in radio with my man, AC. Let's get it. Author, radio show host, and coach, John M. Hawkins, reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them, rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network, and to Tune in radio. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416 529 7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well, be aware, be magical. Welcome back to the Alan Charles Show live in New York City on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And I am your host, Alan Charles. And uh, I'm glad you hung around because I was just in the beginning parts of telling about my intervention. And as I was led to believe, my wife called me uh, during the workday. I work in the city and both. Her and I, as well as her parents, lived in the city, and she called me at work one late morning and told me that her mom was sick and needed me to come to the apartment to help. So I went to the apartment um, on 66th and 2nd and went upstairs, and as I rang the doorbell, I was greeted by my therapist, who happens to be an addiction specialist and does do interventions, but I wasn't aware of that. And so I, my heart has dropped and I come in and I see all these people. And as I shared, there were, I might as well count the people now, but there were a bunch of chairs looking one way and one chair facing them. And I knew exactly which chair belonged to me. And all I can think about was how am I going to get out of this? Because I knew what was coming. So let's count the people that were here. Um, There was my wife, uh, her mother and father, my mother-in-law and father-in-law. So that's three. Then I have my therapist, Nancy. That's four. This is where I've got to explain the other things. So I started to tell you before break that I was, I was pretty crazy. I had, a, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not different, but a lot of the stuff, I had some tough stuff going on. And so it made sense that I was in Cocaine Anonymous. Um, It made sense that I was in Alcohol Anonymous. It took me a long time to come to terms that I actually believed I had an alcohol problem. But 
I learned later on that it doesn't matter. Um, a drug is a drug or is a drink. They're all, they all do the same thing. They take away apprehension and you'll, you'll do things that you might not do. It, it, it skews your judgment. So none of that stuff. So I have no problem saying, yes, I'm an AA, I'm in CA. So those, both those programs I was fine with, but I would not admit in the beginning when I first went to therapy that I had a cocaine problem. I told my therapist I didn't have any problem. So eventually, as the cocaine problem was starting to be found out, I admitted to having a gambling problem because I liked to gamble and I gambled often and I may have had a touch of a problem, but I really, I don't believe I was a gambling addict, but I decided it was better to be a gambling addict than a cocaine addict because I didn't want them to stop my cocaine. So I started going to GA, Gambling Anonymous meetings, and I had a sponsor for that. So here I am. I'm just trying to stay married. I'm trying to keep my job. I'm trying to get better, even though I don't think I really want to. And on top of that, I have a sponsor for three different programs. Most people have one sponsor, but maybe two, but I had to have three. So, so again, it was my wife, mother and father, uh, interventionist, Nancy, and my three sponsors. So that comes up to seven seats. So here we start the intervention. Nancy said, we might as well get it started. And she said, Alan, I think you know what seat is for you. And I smirked and smiled and I said, yes, Nancy. And I to know that. And so I went and sat down and one by one, um, and my wife started, they, everybody had been instructed to write a letter and to tell me what they see going on. Um, so basically it was to tell me how bad I was and how bad the addiction was and that they see it's getting progressively worse and it's not just them. Everybody sees it and we love you and we want to help you. But at this point, you're going to have to make a decision because there are going to be consequences. And I'm just paraphrasing there was different love and support from all these different people, and they all got up and read their letters to me. So I had, and Nancy wrote me one also. So I had to sit and listen to seven letters telling me how much they loved me, how much they they're concerned that they're all the signs that they see, all the things are going on, that this can't continue to happen. I am going to hurt myself. I'm going to die. Um, there are things that are going to start happening, which were already happening, and that they couldn't sit by no, no longer and, I guess, enable me So or look the other way, which was enabling me. So what what they said at the end was – and it was basically the same in each letter that if I did not agree to go to a rehab today, that there were going to be consequences moving forward. And, you know, that I may not have a place to live anymore. Um, the family, people were not going to talk to me um, or you know, nobody believed me anyway. But uh, at that point, you know, I wasn't sure what all the consequences were. I didn't remember. All I know is all I could think of was how am I going to get out of this? So as I sit and I listen to everybody's speech or uh, reading their paper to me, uh, I am just I've got anxiety Um I'm sick to my stomach. Um, I start to think about how the hell did I get here? Look at what this, look at what's going on. I have seven people sitting here all telling me I need to go to a rehab. And, and I'm like, I was in my own mind. I was like, how do I get out of this and what do I do? And and I knew what I was going to do. I mean, it, it, it wasn't a matter of what I was going to do. It was a matter of how I was going to do it. And so at the end, 
Nancy was the last person to share. So what she kind of did as the last person to share is that she was wrapping up everything. So, you know what? At the end of the day, she came up and she told me, okay, Alan, and she wrapped up what everybody had to say in a tiny little ball. And then she asked me that important question. And you know what? We're going to take a quick break. When we get back, you will hear what that important question is. You're listening to the Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and Tuna Radio. We'll be right back. America is out of control. Today's capitalism and the approach to money is in fact the symptom of a more widespread pattern of excessive behavior. In his book, The Culture of Excess, How America Lost Self-Control and Why We Need to Redefine Success, clinical psychologist Dr. Jay Slosar portrays an America where excess fuels the drive to succeed. Dr. Slosar examines the cultural factors that lead to excess ranging from obesity to fraud to pervasive budget deficits. His book examines the powerful economic and social factors and their impact on our psychological well-being. Dr. Slosar explores the psychological impact of increasing narcissism, perfectionism, self-destruction, and our identity confusion. He offers recommendations for helping Generation Me become Generation We. Those who resist Slosar's message will want to avoid his discussion of regulation and his recent message that at this point, democracy must be more important than today's capitalism. Get his book now online or by visiting thecultureofexcess.com. Global Glory, that's the work of Dr. Marina McLean, COO of Global Glory, whose calling is to serve God. A first-generation British-born Londoner of Jamaican descent, Dr. McLean inherited the hunger for the Word from her father, who was a Bible teacher. Growing up, her home was filled with missionaries from the Caribbean islands and America, and she travels the world preaching the gospel. She has a Bachelor of Arts degree in theology and an honorary doctorate of divinity and Christian counseling from Friends International Christian University. Dr. McLean is also a songwriter and recording artist, and her songs are written during summits and conferences in the presence of God. She's recorded three worship albums to date and is in ministry for 28 years alongside her husband, Dr. Rennie McLean, who shares her passion. Visit www.globalglory.org or on Facebook at Global Glory. Call 866 244 5679 and feel the glory. Welcome back to the Alan Shaw Show, live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And I am your host, Alan Charles, and you are in the right place. This is where you come to get your life back every Thursday night from 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And before we went to break, I was sharing my story about the intervention that took place And everybody at the intervention, which was family and friends, and my therapist, who was the head of the intervention, she was finishing up, read to me all the things that she was concerned, how much they love me, and that everybody wants the best for me, and that's why they wrote me the letters, and that there are going to be consequences if I choose not to follow what their intervention recommends. And so Nancy gets to the end of her little speech, and she says, Alan, we would like you to go to rehab today. We have a place lined up. You can go back to work um, and finish up and explain to them or tell your HR department whatever you have to do. And Stacy will take care of the details. And you're in a place where you will be safe, you'll be taken care of, and you can finally start to get better. And she couldn't have said it any better and any sweeter, but very direct. And I looked at her and I paused probably, probably was only 30 seconds, but it felt like I couldn't get a word out for four or five minutes. And so as I just sit there, sat there and kind of was looking inside, trying to come up with an answer. 
And finally, I had to come out with what I was thinking because I, I didn't know how to zig and zag. I was going to come up with some kind of lie. Or, um, so basically what, what I said was I told them that I, I cannot get away from work right now, that there are too many things going on that I was in the middle of. The timing was not good, but that I did hear what everybody said and that I will go to more meetings and I will make a very strong effort to get better and that this won't be necessary again. And I looked at Stacy's face, my wife, and she was disgusted. And they probably, I mean, I'm assuming, you know what? I never asked her. I mean, did you think I was going to go to the rehab with you know me, um, which she was just trying to help, but I was stubborn. And when I didn't think I had a problem, you weren't going to, I wasn't going to go to way to rehab to miss work, to make, to miss making money and all the things that I was doing. So it, it, at the end of the day, it didn't work for me because I was not ready. And so basically I told her no. I said that I will keep an open that if something comes up and I think I need to go in the next couple of weeks, that I'll get some stuff straightened out at work. And then if I need to go, I'll go. And that was all bull because I had no intention of going. That was just enough to get out of the room. And then I had to go back to work. So now I had to hug all seven people, or at least that's what I felt the need to do. And they were the seven most uncomfortable hugs in my entire life. And, oh, Nancy collected all the letters and gave them to me. And I'm like, oh, I don't even know if I still have them. I mean, I have a book and, and files and some stuff with all my recovery stuff and different things that I've saved through the years. And I may or I may not, but I know that I got back to the office and I read through each one of them. And each one of them, I read like the first paragraph. And then as I was starting to read more and more, I just couldn't bear to read the words of people, what they were saying and how bad they thought I was and, and the deterioration or, you know, the specific things of how I've changed or some of the things that I were doing differently or how I was affecting or, or acting Um, and it wasn't to beat me up and they didn't put it in a bad way, but you know, it was, it was almost like they gave, and maybe that was, that's the intention of giving you the letters is that you're going to read it and it's going to open you up to an awareness that all of a sudden you're going to see just how bad you really are or how bad things are really are. And you know what? That's actually what it did for me. Now I'm thinking of it. It did. It showed me just how bad things are. But I was in such denial that, and I was so, um, I guess for lack of a better word, excited and happy when I, or at least I thought I was when I was doing cocaine, that um, this wasn't even a thought of how bad I was. I mean, this this is this has definitely impacted me finally getting it. But this, I'm guessing, was probably somewhere in 2001 or or two. Maybe it was the end of 2002. Oh, or or even the beginning of 2003. I think it was closer to um, 2003. And uh, I don't know. Uh, I still had a long way to go. Uh, my sobriety date is December 8th, 2007. So uh, I still had another th- good four years of using and I was not at my bottom. Unfortunately for me, that bottom kept going lower and lower and lower. So at the end of the day, that the intervention was not successful, but it did plant the seed. And, and I think that it had some positive things that, that, that have helped me. And, um, you know, we're, when we come back, we, we have a, we have one more segment and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what it's like to participate in an intervention 
And I shared some of those things with you and uh, we'll give you some other things to avoid at an intervention. So let's take our last break. You're listening to The Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. We'll be right back. Dr. R.C. will share extraordinary resources and services that promote educational success as well as making a difference in the lives of all social workers as well as the lives of children, adolescents, and teens of today. She will have open discussions addressing many of the issues that we face about our youth and how being employed in the uniquely skilled profession of social work for over 18 years has taught invaluable lessons through her personal experiences. She will also provide real-life facts, examples, and personal stories that will confirm that why serving as a child advocate is extremely beneficial when addressing the needs of the whole child. Listen live Saturdays, 10 a.m. Eastern on the BBM Global Network and tune in radio as Dr. R.C. will provide thought-provoking information that will empower, encourage, and strengthen students, families, and communities across our nation. You can also visit her at soarwithkatie.com. Welcome back to the Alan Charles Show, live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And I am your host, Alan Charles. So, what a what an interesting hour talking, bringing and reminiscing about my intervention <laughs> that uh, that set some things up in my head, and I understood. You know what? There was one more thing I, I wanted to share that I thought about while we were at break, and that is that if it's it doesn't work the intervention the person decides not to go so here i said that um i'm refusing refusing the help basically so if that is the case the people the loved ones the friends whoever all the people that are there within the intervention uh they've listed consequences that they've outlined and they need to be prepared to follow through. So consequences can look like a lot of different things. You could be there with your wife and my wife may have said, Alan, if you do not go to rehab, I no longer want to be married to you. So if you're not going to do this, you're going to need to move out And we're going to start the process of divorce because I am not going to live like that. And that's a very strong possibility. There's plenty of relapses that are, I mean, interventions that have gone down that way. And it's the same thing. Everybody, whatever the uh, consequences are that the people that are there they have to stick to what they say. So my consequences from everybody was I was going to lose everybody. Um, and if I would continue. So I had, I, I guess, for all intents and purposes, the way I just broke this down, I actually had one more chance because they did the intervention. I did not agree to go. So but they did say there's consequences. And if any of these consequences are going to happen, if I pick up again, which of course happened and, you know, there were different kind of consequences and stuff like that. But that's one of the things that you have to be very concerned about, because if you do not go through with your consequences, then there's a chance you'll never help your loved one get better because then you're bluffing and, and they don't believe anything that you do. So regardless of all of that there's another piece here if you are actually involved with the intervention regardless of whether the loved one accepts it or whether they deny it you should also think through how you will take care of yourself now those of us who have had loved ones that have been in addiction or they, and they go to one of these 12-step programs. A lot of us know about support groups for families. So there's Al-Anon and different programs 
And um, they help, they're the support groups for family and friends dealing with addictions. Uh, another thing they would recommend is finding a therapist to discuss coping strategies with any personal issues that you're facing. And um, well, spirituality is an always a, another good one. So turning to a higher power to find peace or understanding. Now remember that your own well-being is an important component of your loved one's recovery. If you're unhealthy, you'll be unable to offer true support and encouragement. So what is it like to participate in an intervention? It's rigorously scripted, and it was exactly what I said. It's driven by the family, the friends, the group usually could be three or four people, but uh, everything that I've read, it would be anywhere from four to eight total where family members, close friends, and for my purposes, my sponsors, who were my friends who were in the programs with me. And you go through that, and, and it, it's tough. Um, but that's why you should find a professional intervention specialist. And uh, you can you can go rehabs. They're listed. You could reach out to me even. So next week, we're going to deal with stories about premonitions. Have you ever heard things that have happened before they happened, an idea popped in your head and it turned into something huge. Well, I'm going to share a couple of those stories with you next week. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next Thursday live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Good night. He used to be an addict, now he's substance free. Telling all about his crazy journey. This has been the Alan Charles Show with your host, Alan Charles. The views and opinions expressed by Alan Charles and guests on the Alan Charles Show are solely their own and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the BBM Global Network or its affiliates. Even though Alan Charles thinks he's an expert at life, we urge you to think about acting on his advice. Even though he has been in recovery for 10 plus years, he is a bit of a mashugana. He's given us the real story, the Alan Charles Show. Ups and downs, losing jobs and the glory, the Alan Charles Show. He helps others avoid that purgatory, the Alan Charles Show. been listening to the bbm global network the ideas views and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas views and opinions of the bbm global network company